there is still a lot of confidence in the market and there is still a lot of liquidity in the market. There's a lot of cash in the market. Uh, as you know, David, I'm occasionally concerned that there will be some event, uh, a so-called black swan, that none of us have interpreted uh, and that that will cause a crisis in confidence and a liquidity squeeze. We aren't seeing that. Uh, I, I think, by the way, parenthetically, that the disintermediation in high yield debt funds is highly intelligent. Uh, I think that we have underemphasized credit quality in a search for yield. And I think what you may be seeing is at least smart households uh, returning to some sense of sanity. The biggest black swan out there that scares me is the trillions of dollars in high yield ETFs where the top structure, the e ETF itself is highly liquid, but the assets that they hold, uh, junk bonds, often over-the-counter bonds, are highly illiquid. If you have a circumstance where nervousness about credit quality comes down to the retail investor and they begin to liquidate the ETFs and the ETF managers are forced to liquidate junk bonds into very illiquid markets, uh, you have uh, a run on the bank that almost can't be contained. Did you know that trillions of dollars are sitting in high-yield ETFs, which could be the ticking time bomb the U.S. economy isn't prepared for? Rick Rule, a seasoned finance expert, is raising the alarm on what he sees as a potential black swan event, one that could send shockwaves through the markets. These ETFs might look highly liquid on the surface, but they're built on a foundation of junk bonds that are dangerously illiquid. Imagine this. If investors suddenly lose confidence in the market, it could trigger a massive sell-off. ETF managers would be forced to liquidate these junk bonds in a market that simply can't absorb them, leading to a chaotic run-on-the-bank scenario that could spiral into a financial crisis. Uh, there was a saying uh, in junk bond markets in the 70s when they were very skinny, uh, that many of these bonds were, David, quote, owl bonds. An owl bond is where you call your broker and say sell, and your broker says, to who? To who? And that's my real terror. Uh, my real terror is that concern about credit quality becomes commonplace, and you have a disconnect between people coming out of the liquid ETFs and the manager's ability to sell the underlying assets. So I'm delighted to see people beginning to come out of those high-yield ETFs now. If they did it gradually and rateably over time, uh, we could uh, perhaps sidestep my biggest single concern about the market. Well, what I hope people are doing uh, is putting it in shorter-term obligations. Uh, maybe U.S. 10-year treasuries accepting 4.4 uh, with effectively no credit risk other than the deterioration of the purchasing power of the dollar yes. uh, relative to 7 uh, in uh, assets that I think are highly susceptible to default. Hopefully, people are shorting, are taking shorter duration, uh, taking less yield, uh, and improving the credit quality of their savings. I don't know that that's what's happening, but I hope uh, for their sake that's what's happening. Well, I, it depends on fairly priced. I, yeah, I, I would suggest to you that the real deterioration in U.S. dollar purchasing power is more like 7% uh, than the 2.6% su suggested by the CPI. If my number is right, the U.S. 10-year Treasury paying 4.2, 4.3 has a negative real yield, uh, and any liquidity is excess liquidity. But I'm being perhaps too arcane uh, as a credit analyst. I am not seeing any evidence of illiquidity in the broad market. Uh, the buoyancy in the S&P 500 uh, funds, the buoyancy of the QQQ, you know, the technology index. Uh, I still see a market where institutional and individual confidence is high, perhaps not as high as two years ago, but certainly compared to other periods of time when there were liquidity squeezes, uh, both confidence and liquidity in markets seems to be very high. People who are investors in investors, people who are speculators in junior resource equities may suggest that the liquidity isn't there. But I would suggest that even there in the best issues, not the lame, the halt and the blind, 
but the best issues, uh, the private placements are uniformly oversubscribed and uniformly oversubscribed without warrants. If you look back over the 50 years that I've been in this market, I would describe this as a liquid, as a liquid rather than an illiquid market. Uh, I mean, I, I, I suggest that for 75 or 80 percent of the junior issuers, they have no value. So if they have a bid, that bid is excessive. But in the quality end of the market, which is to say what investors are willing to pay for names like BHP, Rio, Glencore, uh, even tech, uh, relative to the incentive price necessary to produce the commodities that humankind needs to maintain its material standard of living, uh, those stocks are too cheap. There is uh, illiquidity there at the top end of the market. A very important question. The first is that while the gold price has gone up, which would lead people to expect broader margins, the cost of producing gold has gone up a lot. <clears throat> Labor costs have gone up, cement prices have gone up, steel prices have gone up, energy prices have gone up. But in particular, on a global basis, the, 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 uh, uh, the social take, taxes, royalties, uh, offsite capital contributions by the industry has gone up too. Uh, and so the margins that people had expected to get, the operating margins that people had expected to get as a consequence of higher gold prices, ha have disappointed people. They haven't come through. On the more cost-efficient issuers, the Agnico Eagles of the world is an example, uh, the margin increases have been there, and the markets have rewarded them. But the more marginal producers have not seen the margin increases that people would expect. The second thing, I think, is that the institutional investor uh, has become quite disenchanted with the gold trade, the gold equities trade. Uh, I think that stems back to the decade 2000 to 2010, where the gold price increased from, let's call it $250 to, let's call it $1,700, a six or seven fold increase in the gold price. And the free cash flow per share on the XAU fell. It took real skill to generate declining free cash flows per share when the selling price of your commodity increased sixfold. Now, I would argue that the industry is structurally different now than then, and the expectation of the few remaining institutional investors is much harsher now. So my suspicion is that if the gold price continues to trend higher, that you will begin to see those operating margins, but you haven't seen them yet. I think the third thing, David, is that the increase that we saw in gold prices <clears throat> until about 25 weeks ago was led by foreign central bank buying, uh, and those buyers don't buy gold shares. So it would make perfect sense that if the uh, leader, if the buyer, if the liquidity that drove the gold price higher was central banks, and they don't buy gold shares, uh, that the gold shares wouldn't have the same bid that gold had. Western retail investors, measured by inflows and outflows from physical ETFs, uh, only became buyers of gold 20 weeks ago. Until then, they had been continuous sellers for two years. And that's the natural market for the gold equities. So I would suggest that the gold equities bid was gone while the gold bid was present, which explains the discontinuity uh, in those in pricing until 20 weeks ago. Uh, I think historically what you see is what you have seen, which is to say gold bull markets are usually led by the physical. They're led by the bullion. Uh, the second to move uh, are the large companies which benefit directly by, from an increase in the bullion price. Later stages of a bull market, you will see the smaller companies begin to outperform the bigger companies. Uh, part of that is to be expected. The larger companies early in a bull market have higher share prices relative to asset values and a lower cost of capital. If the better of the smaller companies don't get don't catch up, they get taken over, which is to say the market arbitrages away the valuation discounts. But what we're seeing in this market is consistent with what we've been what we've seen in precious metals and precious metals equities markets going back 50 years. Thanks for tuning in to today's video. We covered some critical points about the potential risks looming in the market, as highlighted by Rick Rule. We explored the dangers of high-yield ETFs and their underlying illiquid assets, the possibility of a black swan event triggering a financial crisis, and the importance of understanding how these dynamics could affect your investments.
if you're concerned about the market stability or just want to stay informed, these are issues you can't afford to ignore. If you found this discussion valuable, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an update. Give this video a like if you enjoyed it, and feel free to share your thoughts in the comments section below.